All right, well, it's just about time. So I'm gonna get started with the housekeeping bit so we can stay on time. Uh, welcome everyone. This session is Antarctic Ice Sheet Behavior from Marine and Terrestrial Records. This is actually the second session. I hope uh, you were able to make it yesterday, um, but if not, the recording should be available on the conference website and eventually, hopefully on YouTube. Um, this, section, this session is focused on geological and geophysical studies across a range of different time scales. So we're concerned with the processes, thresholds, magnitudes, and rates of ice sheet change. The conveners are Richard Jones, Julia Wellner, Mike Bentley, and myself. Welcome, everyone. Uh, the session is being recorded, and uh, it'll be available on the conference website and YouTube. So if you of your talk being recorded, you can, I believe, um, speakers have the ability to just pause the recording in the corner of your screen and then restart it when you're done with your sensitive material. Um, but if you'd like, you can also chat myself or um, any of the other conveners who can do this for you. Um, if you, for the speakers, I encourage you to turn on your camera when you're speaking if you're comfortable and able. I think that'll make everything feel a more feel more personal since we are all. Um, and we're also going to do something a little bit different. So um, the structure of the session is four 10 minute talks, and then we're going to have a question and answer session, and then we'll have another four uh, 10 minute talks. Um, please put all your questions in the Q&A or the chat function in Zoom. And what we're going to do when we reach the Q&A session is um, I'll give you, if you asked a question, I'll invite you to unmute and ask the question yourself. If you don't respond within a few seconds, I'll go ahead and read that question aloud. Um, but that is an option today. Um, we also have e-posters as part of the session, so I'll put the link in the chat at the end. Make sure to check those out as well. Um, and let's get started. The first two talks are pre-recorded, I believe. So I'm going to stop um, my screen share now, and we can have the first talk. Oh, I'm frozen. Good afternoon, I'm Adrián López Quiroz, and I proceed with the presentation Green Clay Autogenesis, a really bold uh, Somebody feel free to bump me off and get started. I believe my Zoom's frozen. First of all, I would like to highlight what is the. I don't know how to bump you off, Ruthie. Um, <laughs> so, um, I think our IT staff should be able to do that. As described I, by the international. I can still straight your screen, Ruthie. Place. All right, I'm going to quit and rejoin, and that might do it. Okay. So, um, for the IT support team, if you can go ahead and, once Ruthie quits, play the first video, that would be great. At the right hand, we can see the crystal geometry of glauconite, which is formed by a dioctahedral. Um, sorry, guys, we will get this going in just a moment. Um, as we said, we had no glitches yesterday, so we're just getting them all out of the way at once right now. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, I'm Adrián López Quiroz, and I proceed with the presentation Green Clay Autogenesis, a really bold paleoenvironmental indicator for reconstructing Antarctic Cenozoic climate history. First of all, I would like to highlight what is the mineral glauconite. Glauconite, sensu stricto, is a dioctahedral potassium and iron rich interlayer deficient mica, as described by the International Association for the Study of Clays and the International Mineralogical Association. At the right hand, we can see the crystal geometry of glauconite, which is formed by a dioctahedral, tetahedral, octahedral, tetahedral structure separated from the next one by an interlayer sheet. Many mechanisms for the glauconitization process have been proposed during the last decades. Currently, the most accepted theory is that of precipitation dissolution recrystallization. This theory includes a two-stage glauconitization model where mature glauconite formation involves two major phases. The formation of a potassium-poor iron-rich glauconitic esmectite, the precursor esmectite mineral through microbial oxidation, and a gradual enrichment with potassium to form a potassium-rich glauconitic mica, which is known as the esmectite to glauconite reaction. 
Glauconite or the glauconifaces is a sensitive proxy of low sedimentation rates in the marine system and represent a tool for sedimentological and sequence stratigraphic interpretation due to its association with well-defined trends of sea level change. An in-progress compilation of places where this mineral has been identified can be shown in the map. Glauconi audigenesis in Antarctica has received little attention to date when compared with other mid to low latitude Cenozoic to present Glauconi records. Cenozoic Glauconi bearing phases have been reported in late Eocene sedimentary sequences in Antarctica, located in the map with red dots. However, the genesis, the positional setting control, and environmental implication of Glauconi in these Antarctic regions are loosely constrained. Antarctic Glauconi deposit does provide an opportunity to study the poorly understood environmental condition before the onset of major Antarctic glaciations. The Eocene Oligocene transition was an outstanding global climatic event involving cooling, the onset of full scale glaciation in Antarctica, progressive global sea level fall, and an increasing ocean productivity. The opening and deepening of southern ocean gateways was long invoked to cause such major climatic changes along the EOT, allowing the exchange of water masses eventually leading to the development of the ACC. During the initial stages of opening of the Drake Passage, the South Orny microcontinent was isolated from the Antarctic Peninsula due to the rifting and opening of Powell Basin. The Cenozoic sedimentary record of ODP Site 6 and 6 on Seymour Island in the deep of the Antarctic Peninsula covered the late Eocene early Oligocene, providing an opportunity to gain insight into the paleoenvironmental evolution of this region, including the tectonic, paleoclimatic, and paleoceanographic changes that occur during the gateway opening. In this slide, we see the geological setting of both the South Orny microcontinent and the Seymour Island in the deep of the Antarctic Peninsula. This presentation will be focused on the described glauconitic packstone phases from ODP Site 696 and the submeseta formation in Seymour Island. A suite of textural, mineralogical, and geochemical analyses were used to characterize in detail this glauconitization event. Two population types of glauconi grains were observed in ODP 696. Type 1 is characterized by rounded grains without cracks and with road surfaces with flaky nanostructures. Type 1 often preserve ill-defined globules and caterpillar nanostructures, resembling bacterial activity in its formation. From a microtextural point of view, type 1 is classified between evolved grains. Type 2 is characterized by rounded cerebroid dark green grains, often cracked at the margins and with smooth surfaces with flaky honeycombed nanostructures. From a microtextural point of view, type 2 clearly shows an evolved shape, slightly higher than type 1. Other autogenic minerals as parite and silica minerals like amorphous silica, opal city, or microcrystalline quartz were found closely related to process of formation of the glauconi grains. In the submeseta formation of Seymour Island as in ODP 696, the same population types of glauconi grains, also identified as type 1 and type 2, were observed with similar nanostructures. From a microtextural point of view, type 1 and type 2 clearly shows an evolved shape as in ODP 696. Both types were documented throughout the submeseta formation sequence in each glauconitic horizon as, as shown here. XRD analysis of the paramagnetic fraction reaching glauconitic grains indicate slightly higher spacing reflection than expected for pure glauconite. After ethylene glycol treatment, the expansion of the peak to 9.8 Armstrong allowed to characterize this glauconi grain as glauconite smectite mixed layer content. In the submeseta formation of Seymour Island, XRD analysis of the paramagnetic fraction reaching glauconitic grains indicate the same as in ODP 696, a glauconite smectite mixed layer content. 
In addition, reticular images from high-resolution transmission electromicroscopy display well-defined lattice rings of glauconitic crystal and corroborate the presence of glauconite package with an interlayer spacing of 10 Armstrom, including interstratified poor crystalline smectite layers. According to mineral chemistry analysis, type 2 displays slightly higher values in potassium, iron and aluminium content than type 1. From a mineral chemistry point of view, our types 1 and 2 grains are evolved. In the Sumeseta formation of Seymour Island, mineral chemistry analysis indicate the same as in ODP 696. Type 2 displays higher values in potassium, iron and aluminium content than type 1. From a mineral chemistry point of view, or types 1 and 2 grains in Seymour Island are evolved. In the right-hand figure chemical analysis of both ODP-696 and Seymour Island, together with other EOC glauconite data, are shown within the square for the composition of glauconitic grain. Late eosine glauconite types 1 and 2 in ODP-696 and Seymour Island are therefore interpreted to be mature evolved grains according to its textural, crystallographic and mineral chemical properties. In this figure, we can see the time required to produce an autochthonous evolved glauconite grain in the glauconitization model, which is considered to be higher than 100,000 years for ancient glauconite bearing records. We thus interpret uh, types 1 and 2 have been formed in situ in low energy environment, being possible to assess the physicochemical condition prevailing during glauconitization. This condition occur in an open shelf environment under suboxid condition near the sediment water interface. These environmental conditions were triggered by low sedimentation rates and recurrent winnowing action by bottom currents leading to a stratigraphic condensation. The condensed glauconite bearing sections provide an overview of a continuous sea level rise condition predating the onset of Antarctic glaciation during the EOT. Furthermore, sediment burial, drop of oxygen levels and ongoing reduction of oxic to sulfidic condition resulting in iron sulfide precipitation, for example, pyrite as we can see in the right hand figure, were a limiting factor for the glauconitization by sequestration of iron 2. During the late Eocene, the South Thorny microcontinent was thus attached to the Antarctic Peninsula and terrigenous sediments were deposited in shallow water under condition of reduced oxygen, low salinity and temperate climate. In the latest Eocene, terrigenous input was reduced due to the separation of the South Thorny microcontinent from the Antarctic Peninsula by protopowell basin opening. Decreased sediment supply during continuous deepening lead to the deposition of a condensed glauconic section at ODP-696. Recurrent winnowing by bottom currents and suboxic condition near the sediment water interface. Furthermore, we suggest that the study area was located in a shallow water flow pathway through the protopowell basin triggering productivity upwelling. And thank you for your attention. If you're speaking, Ruthie, end mute. Well, if Ruthie's struggling there with the mute settings, maybe. Um, Thank you for playing that first video for us and an interesting topic to get us started today. Um, Ruthie's officially hosting us today, but might have a Zoom issue. Um, we will go to the second video right away. Hello, I'm Michele Babesco from OGS, Italy. 
and uh, I will talk today about a paper that was published last year in Deep Sea Research, and uh, it's about bottom current control on sediment deposition between the Islin Bank and the Gila Canyon uh, since the late Miocene. Uh, it's an integrated seismic oceanographic approach, as you will see, and this is the list uh, of author and the affiliation. This is the study area where we collected the uh, seismic data in black, uh, in the area where there are these diamonds, which are the IODP uh, Expedition 374 sites. And um, this is the final conclusive diagram that I will show you later, but just see that we are within the Rossi Gyre in this area, and in particular, there is the an Antarctic slope current flowing this way. And this is the Eli Canyon in blue. Okay. This is the um, bathymetry uh, multi beam that we collected on top of the um, uh, Ibxo uh, bathymetry and uh, again in red the seismic line some I will show you and uh, this is the interpretation the morphologic interpretation and uh, uh, I will mainly talk about these uh, sediment drifts or conduritic mounds that are uh, elongated obliquely with respect to the slope of the Isling bank this is an example of these contouritic mounds, which are quite impressive in terms of morphology. And uh, on the Islin bank, we identify seven uh, seismic units uh, that we calibrated with the IODP site 1523 and with the regional uh, seismic stratigraphy. Uh, there are a couple of these mound, mound one, and mound seven and you may see the start grown growing of the mound is uh, from uh, rossi sequence four essentially uh, on the continental rise uh, this is the hillary canyon we are here on the uh, insta side of the hillary canyon and again we identify seven seismic units that we calibrated uh, with the uh, ODP site 1524. About the ages and the unconformity that we identified, on the left you may see the uh, time depth chart and on the right the age model from uh, IODP data. For the site on the Islin Bank, 1523, and the one on the um, eastern side of the Hillary Canyon, site 1524, where there was no logging available. So the velocities uh, were only measured on board, but were severely underestimated. And uh, thus we consider a, a velocity model or depth conversion uh, that better uh, that provided a better match between the uh, unconformities that we uh, identified on the seismic and the hiatus that we that were identified in the drill site. This is for the hydrographic information we have. Um, we made some snapshot during the 17 uh, 2017 cruise with two CTD cast, and uh, we identified in both the speed, turbidity, and potential temperature uh, some deep uh, water masses, namely the uh, Antarctic bottom water and the modified Rossi bottom waters. And for a longer view of the hydrographic condition, we I use a simulation, a numerical simulation, uh, and uh, to provide uh, a comparison between 
the snapshot and the longer term simulation, we compared the horizontal velocity from the vessel mounted ADCP and the simulation here at the bottom and uh, the two match quite well. So let's uh, show the uh, results of the simulation. The simulated bottom current velocities over five years uh, are this one expressed in percentage. So 100% means that uh, bot strong bottom currents always occur over the area. Uh, these in magenta are the uh, sediment drifts, while uh, again these uh, stars are the two uh, IODP side that I mentioned before. And these R1, R2, and R3 are the main pathway of the cascading dense shelf water. One follows the Eli Canyon. Uh, R1 follows the Isobat, while R2 is detaching in the area of the uh, sediment drift. And uh, these uh, dots are respectively the CTD 9 and 10 that we measure during the cruise. And this is to give you uh, an idea of the variability uh, from the model uh, from a period from the beginning of January to the end of March. And uh, you may see that there is some variability, but these three main uh, paths of the currents are confirmed uh, by the numerical model. And finally, uh, I will show the reconstruction of the evolution on, of one of the mound and the um, prevailing oceanographic condition. So during uh, Rossi sequence three, there was filling of pre-existing morphological depression in a situation with relatively weak Antarctic slope current. Then during Rossi sequence four, there was start of thickness increase on top of this uh, uh, high. In a, and this was the onset of the bottom current activity. Then we have a higher availability of sediment delivered to the area. And so there was and the continuation of bottom current activity. And then there was and then there was an increase, uh, an onset thickness increase over the mound between uh, 15 to 8 million years during Rossi sequence five. Then there was a very energetic bottom current uh, condition, and what this corresponded to an uh, erosive and non-depositional phase during the uh, Rossi um, unconformity tree from eight to five million years. And this is recorded by Ayetos in the IODP sites. Then uh, during Rossi sequence six, six in the Pliocene, there was filling of the of depressed part. And this was during a phase of suppressed bottom current activity. And then during Rossi sequence seven, there was a highly focused deposition due to strong bottom current activity during uh, Rossi sequence seven in the, in the Pleistocene. So to conclude, uh, this is the finally conclusive uh, summary graphic uh, where we where you see the evolution in the seismic that we uh, summarized with this onset, uh, very energetic, weak and restricted phases that correspond to uh, the uh, stages that I mentioned before. So the Rossi sequence from, from uh, 19, 17 million years to the, let's say, present time. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you so much. Uh, I also want to thank the SCAR IT support for being awake in the middle of the night to uh, facilitate this session. So thank you. Um, Shaoxia, you're next. And a reminder to put your questions in the chat or the Q&A. And we'll get to it at the end of the, the chunk of four talks. Should I start? Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, thank you. OK, good. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Xiao Xia from China. Um, it's great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to present our recent work from the Elbe Basin. Um, I'd like to also use the opportunity to thank my collaborators and they offered great help for me to have deep understanding of this topic. Uh, so the study region Elbe Basin uh, is located at East Antarctic margin and it's formed during the early Cretaceous as the East Antarctic and uh, the India Rift, uh, Rift apart. And this region has a very complex water masses. For example, the Pritz Bay is uh, one of the four discovered key locations for the Antarctic bottom water formation. In addition to that, and the region also has uh, the circumpolar deep water and Pritz Bay gyre, and also the Death Shelf water, and also the Antarctic circumpolar currents. Uh, um, as you see from the left figure, um, our study region has a lot of uh, size, 2D seismic lines, which are showing with the gray and yellow uh, lines. And there are also several, uh, several ODP sets uh, showing with the right stars. Next two slides, I will give a brief introduction about the data source. Uh, our major results are based on this two data set. So we used about uh, 12 seismic surveys, which are all available from SDS database. Um, they were collected in the past 40 years by um, multi-nations. I think there are probably still two or three seismic surveys from this region are not in the SDS database yet, and hopefully they will be released in the future. Um, they, in, in addition to the ODP side, there's also uh, in the seismic lines, there are also two ODP lags in this region. The first ODP lag was drilled in uh, 1988, and all the drilling sites are located on the Pritz Bay Shelf and also Kangla Plateau. Uh, 12 years later, another ODP lag happened, uh, which drilled. Uh, on the shelf and on the slope and also on the continental rise, there are three drilling sites. Um, there was also a first attempt to try to make a correlation from the shelf to the deep water after the second ODP lag. Uh, surprisingly, this was also the last uh, attempt that uh, uh, the researchers have focused on the deep uh, depositional process. I think there's a, a big knowledge gap who certainly exists in the deep sea part of the Pritz Bay region. That's also one of my key motivation to uh, work in this region. Um, my objectives are to building a new shelf to basin correlation made of a network of 75,000 kilometers of seismic lines from the 12 seismic surveys and also the ODP set and try to identify and mapping the depositional features to provide improved uh, understanding of glacier influence, the sedimentary system. And the results are based on our uh, recent publications. First, I'd like to start with the geomorphology of the two close margins in the study region, the Pritz Bay margin and Mark Robs land margin. Uh, the Pritz Bay margin has relative wide shelf and there's trough moss band developed on the slope. However, in the deep water part, we can see the sedimentary structures um, didn't change that much. On the Max and Rob's land margin, we have a very narrow shelf. Um, there's no trough moss fence, uh, but there's uh, a large sediment drift, uh, sediment waves, and also submarine channels developed in this section. 
Uh, here's our little summary of the geomorphological differences of these two uh, margins. I think the rest of the slides, I will be more focusing on the uh, deep water part of the Mark Robinson land margin, and I'll also talk a little bit with the Prince Bay margin. Uh, so to understand the depositional process in the deep water, we have to solve the H issue for the main sedimentary features. Uh, we consider the, the two rec uh, three recent ODP set. Uh, I have to point out that actually in the deep water, we only got one drilling site, 1165, which drilled about one kilometer sediment. And the, the oldest uh, sediment is about the early Miocene, which means uh, there's uncertainties for the pre Miocene age. Uh, however, as I mentioned, we have a very good uh, seismic data coverage. So combined with the seismic reflection patterns and ODP set, I think we're confident to suggest the age, especially for a large time framework, for example, from pre-glacier, transitional and the uh, full glacier. Today, I will be focusing on the transitional and the full glacier phases. Um, the main discovery of the transitional phase we found is the well-preserved clinal forms on the slope. The suggested age is mid late to uh, EOC to EO, uh, EO boundary. And we think that the, the clinal forms are probably the first glacial signal of East Antarctic ice sheet. Uh, we also observed the two additional clinal forms that uh, next to the previous clinal forms. Uh, we think that those clinal forms are pres were preserved, uh, preserved very fast uh, due to the onset of glaciers, which providing a large sediment. Um, however, this hypothesis and the age has to be tested in the future by drilling site. Um, our four glacier phases started from the early Oligocene, from this very long, beautiful seismic image, we can see that the four glacier section is dominated by sediment drift channels and also sediment waves. And the, the thickness maps also shows very interesting changes. For example, from pre-glacier to full glacier, uh, we observe the deposition center has been shifted towards the west and northwest. And the deeper center is dominated by sediment drift, uh, which indicate active bottom currents, probably started from the early Oligocene. Uh, we will also look, the cl uh, look close to one of the drift bodies, which is located at the west flank of this uh, wide canyon. Uh, we interpreted the drift body with the four seismic units, uh, which represented the four stages uh, as initial, rapid growth, maintenance, and also barrel stage. I will talk about the, the indication of the environmental changes in our summary slides with the other uh, depositional features. Uh, the other interesting uh, deposition feature is the sediment waves, uh, which are strong asymmetric and orientated both deep and traverse to the continental margin, which means they probably uh, formed under an influence of mixed system. And also very interesting, the extensive sediment wave field actually appeared from the mid to late Miocene. The next slide, I will try to explain how the sediment waves formed and why they formed in this time slice. So we think that the sediment waves were formed under the interaction of the turbidet currents, bottom currents, and also increase of circumpolar deep water. Um, there, uh, the increase of the circumpolar deep water also supported by some studies based on the isotopes. Um, they suggest there was an increased export of North Atlantic deep water um, from the mid to late Miocene. Uh, the North Atlantic deep water is one of the key contributor for the circumpolar deep water of the Southern Ocean. Uh, the, therefore, the, mix, the mixing of the uh, three water masses uh, will lead to a sinking flow with reduced velocity, which will favor the construction of the sediment waves. Uh, 
And the last glacier phase is happened in the Pliocene. Uh, we observed the trough moss fang. Uh, the trough moss fang is composed by the multiple MTDs, which is resulted by glacier maximum in the early Pliocene. Uh, here's our next summary slides, and those figures are the mapped uh, the depths of the key boundaries. For example, the EU boundary, early Miocene and middle Miocene and early Pliocene. Um, the EU boundary represents the onset of the drift. Uh, as we can see from the depth maps, there's a very limited drift body, which probably indicates a proto-Antarctic bottom water formation and expanded ice sheet. And from the early Miocene to the middle Miocene, the drift body experienced a rapid growth stage, uh, which indicates that East Antarctic ice sheet probably reached its maximum during this period. And there's also uh, vigorous uh, bottom current activities. Uh, from the mid to late Miocene, it's the drift maintain stage. Um, the drift actually didn't grow much, but there's extensive sediment waves uh, in this period, which indicate the dynamic of glaciers and increase the circumpolar deep waters I talked in the previous slides. And the, the last stage is the Pliocene. And we can see that from the Pliocene to the present day, the drift didn't change much at all. And there's only a trough moss fan was formed, which indicate uh, cyclic glaciers and relative sluggish ocean circulation changes compared to the previous time. So the outlook, I think the history of a pre miocene sediment deposition of Edbe Basin is crucial to improve the understanding of early glacier dynamics. Uh, to solve this issue, of course, we need more data and especially the new drilling site. I do believe that the clinal forms and sediment drift to be reported in our study are the potential great drilling targets. And thank you for your attention and special thanks to the SDO database. Great job, thank you so much. Um, you. Okay, Ellie, you're next. And afterwards we'll have some uh, Q&A session. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. Awesome. All right, so hello everyone. My name is Ellie Miller and I'm a recent graduate of Vanderbilt University. And the project I will be presenting on today is titled An Investigation of the Source of the Serious Group Deposits in the Transantarctic Mountains, Antarctica, and has been done in collaboration with the National Science Foundation Grant 184242 in the US Antarctic Program. And I would like to thank all my collaborators that are listed on the screen and at the end of this presentation for their help in making this project possible. All right, so a little bit of introduction to the Sirius group. The Sirius group, more broadly, is a set of 43 glacial deposits scattered throughout the Transantarctic Mountains, mostly concentrated in the central and southernmost portions of the range. The group itself is comprised mostly of diamictites, um, but is also occasionally interbedded with layers of conglomerates and mudstones, and something that makes the Sirius group really unique is how thick these deposits are, with some of them being over 100 meters thick in some regions. Geomorphological setting and paleo ice flow directions also suggest multiple phases of deposition, not just one during a restricted time interval. And discovery of Pliocene age diatoms, terrestrial woods and leaves, uh, some of which are pictured on the right, have also fueled much debate about the age and also the stability of the Eastern Arctic ice sheet when they were deposited. These unique characteristics of the Sirius group hint not only to its complex history of deposition and erosion, um, but are also adding to our motivation to pursue a provenance study of this group. So all of our, our field sites are scattered throughout the Transantarctic Mountains in three specific locations at Tillite Spur, Bennett Platform, and at Meyer Desert. All of our samples have been retrieved from the Polar Rock Repository at Ohio State University and really represent different geographical regions in this range and are all positioned on different outlet glaciers, which are pictured on this figure here. So at the Beardmore Glacier, we have Meyer Desert. At the Shackleton Glacier, we have Bennett Platform. And at the Reedy Glacier in the southmost end of the range, we have Tillite Spur. 
So sort of our motivations here is we, that we know the East Antarctic ice sheet is susceptible to change and flow and extent throughout its history, but still we don't know a lot about its evolution. And these tills that are left behind in places like the dry valleys and other ice-free areas of Antarctica can help us begin to reconstruct this history and also hint at how it will continue to change as the planet warms. So some of our driving questions for this project are, have gl glacial flow and erosional patterns of the East Antarctic ice sheet changed over time? If so, what can this tell us about the stability or instability of the East Antarctic ice sheet when the Sirius group was deposited? How well correlated is the provenance of the Sirius group across the range? And are we seeing similar trends across a breadth of geographically distinct deposits? And finally, is there a provenance characteristic or fingerprint that can help us identify it in other locations? So sort of our methodology in approaching this project is sort of three tiered um, and sort of figuring out any provenance or erosional patterns. And that would be changes in grain size, changes in geochemistry, and then also changes in zircon, uranium lead age populations. So starting off with some data, particularly grain size, here we have plotted the percentages of so sand, silt, and clay within each sample across all three sites. And you can see at the bottom, it shows you where you are in the unit from youngest to oldest. And as you can see, the percentages remain fairly consistent through each site. Tillite Spur is really the only site where we see silt percentages increase as you move towards the younger material and sand percentages decrease as you move towards the younger material. Otherwise, um, we have some outliers in the data such as TSO8 and DMH092 um, that are not super characteristic of some of the other samples within these sections, um, but we're generalizing that they, these, are, these grain size distributions are remaining fairly consistent over time. Um, and sort of to, the, this data is not included, we have also calculated chemical index of alteration values. Um, and those have also remained consistently low, meaning our samples have been subject to little weathering um, since deposition. Now the CIA values at Tillite Spur are higher than those of Meyer Desert and Bennett, Pla Bennett Platform, but still there are no trends through time. And so to sort of supplement this data and sort of this conclusion we're making about weathering rates, we have also calculated rubidium or plotted rubidium strontium ratios versus SiO2. And as these samples begin to weather, we know that strontium sticks more to clay than it does um, to anything else within the sample. So we would see these samples be naturally enriched in strontium um, throughout time or throughout the section. And we're not really seeing any trends through time here. Next, um, we've sort of taken a look at indicators of source material. And to better examine some of the data, we have combined a mobile element data, specifically zirconium and barium and neotrium and niobium for all three sites. Um, samples from Tillite Spur are represented with red, Meyer Desert in green, and Bennett Platform in blue. For both zirconium barium and neotrium niobium, the sample sites bunched together within the value ranges we expect for granitic source material. Um, within the Transantarctic Mountains, and that's per Pachier's 2004 paper. And for zirconium and barium, we observe higher values for tillate spur, but this is also a trend that was observed by Pachier. And this distribution of the combined data allows us to interpret that the source material of the Shackleton, Reedy, and Beardmore glaciers was not changing extensively over time and sort of hinting at the stability of erosional patterns at each site as well. At, at each site as well. Next, we have um, individual probability density plots for the locations at Tillite Spur. And you can see across all of these different plots, we have one really distinct peak. Um, and that's beginning to fall around 515 million years old. And I'll take us to the next plot, which is our cumulative distribution function. And you can really see how much of those um, zircon ages are falling in that 515 million year old range. About 60 to 80% of our population has fallen within that range. But you can see we also have some secondary peaks at 593 million years old and 362. And this is really what we're looking for. We know that that 515 peak is characteristic of many rocks in the Transantarctic Mountains and can often be attributed to the Ross orogeny um, produced by the Granite Harbor intrusives. But what we're really looking for are these older and younger age peaks that are maybe giving us that provenance fingerprint we're looking for um, in this project. We've also run a Kamolgorov Smirnov test to see if these um, uh, zircon populations are statistically the same. And what we're seeing is that, yes, these diamictites are similar, um, but we're seeing that the conglomerates within this within Tillite Spur specifically are different. 
Next, we have our Zircon data for Bennett platform. Again, still seeing a really sharp peak at around 515, but also seeing a lot of younger material as well included in, within this section. Here's our cumulative distribution function as well. Again, we have that smaller percentage of zircon ages that are falling in that 515 age peak range, um, and we're still seeing those secondary age peaks that are both older and younger. Again, Kamolgorov's Mirnov test to determine if they're statistically the same, and we are seeing that yes, for the most part, um, they are statistically similar across each of these samples. And then jumping into some conclusions. Um, so <clears throat> the aggregate data allows us to conclude that there has been pretty much little weathering of these samples since they were deposited, um, indicating cold and dry conditions at these three sample sites. At each site, we see no indication of a change in source material over time, which indicates that flow patterns and associated erosional processes of each outlet glacier were also consistent during the deposition of our samples. These few points um, allow us to construct a general story that the East Antarctic ice sheet has been cold and stable for millions of years. And sort of our next steps for this project, you'll notice that we do not yet have zircon data for Meyer Desert. Um, that's currently being processed. Um, so seeing how that works into the data set and also comparing zircon age peaks across all three of our sample sites. And finally, solidifying our understanding of zircon age trends within the Sirius group, if there are any. Um, thank you everyone for your attention and thank you to all the collaborators and um, research institutions that have helped make this project possible. Great, thanks so much. Um, we are going to spend some time on questions now. There aren't any yet in the Q&A and chat. So um, I'm gonna invite anyone who has a question to either request to unmute or go ahead and unmute and ask it yourself. I have a question, Ruthie, for Ellie. Um, Ellie, thanks for this great talk. Um, I really enjoyed that. And it's interesting to see a new data on a, what is, of course, a, a long standing set of questions. Um, and so because it's long standing, I, I'll acknowledge that I'm asking maybe loaded or difficult questions. So just your gut feeling. Um, okay. <laughs> You ended with saying, so in conclusion, East Antarctic ice sheet has been cold and stable for millions of years. So very generous. Agree with me? <laughs> yeah. So like exactly how cold and stable do you mean? I mean, and how do you tie that to some of the offshore data, for example, um, about dynamic ice sheet? So. Yeah. So since our data set's not complete, I we don't really have a full picture of what this stability period looks like for depositing the serious group. And that's something we're actively um, trying to understand. And I know it, it gets a little jumbled, especially with the history of the serious group and sort of understanding and um, placing exact measurements on how all these deposits are, when they were deposited here, et cetera. Um, so we've been, we've been trying to be very careful with our language too. Um, um, and not, I guess, making super decisive conclusions yet until we have our full data sets and are able to determine, okay, what can these three big deposits of the Sirius group tell us about the ice sheet when they were deposited at their specific localities. But based on the preliminary data, what we're seeing now with grain size, geochemistry, and then also zircon data, we are seeing trends um, that are hinting at stability when these were deposited. We're not really sure what that age stretch is yet, um, but are actively towards working towards answering those questions. But we haven't quite yet looked into offshore data as well, which is definitely something, a supplement that would be very valuable to this project. Thanks very much. That was a really nice answer. And I have a follow-up follow -up question, which is so, uh, for you, Ellie, uh, which was so, um, you found that the there wasn't um, that detectable provenance changes in these sediments. And I'm wondering how much variability or dynamicism could you have with the same provenance? Like how, how much of a constraint does that provide spatially? Um, 
I am not exactly sure. Um, that's again, another big question that we're working towards answering because each of these sites are very distinct um, and sort of the general characteristics they're displaying um, because they are geographically so spread out as well. Um, so we're really trying to draw um, comparisons between the three. Um, and that's really hard to do, especially since there are so, so many uh, deposits of the Sirius group spread out throughout the Transantarctic Mountains as well. Um, so while we only have a data set of three, we are seeing some trends that are maybe hinting at general provenance constraints, um, but haven't made any uh, distinctive conclusions about what those are yet. Thank you. I have a question for Shasha. Um, so you mentioned that you have this big undertaking of uh, looking across the whole continent and, and reconstructing these sediment packages. And I'm wondering where around the continent is there a lack of data? Like where do we as a where do we need to focus our efforts to collect enough data so that you can complete that goal? Oh, well, it's a good question. I think the uh, definitely uh, the data on the uh, for the geophysical data on the shelf probably um, still missing a lot uh, because we don't really have uh, a good resolution of seismic lines. Uh, um, but there's a good uh, ODP, uh, ODP drilling site, I would say. But I think what really missing is the um, drilling site for the slope and the deep sea. And imagine in the Prisby region, the maximum sediment thickness actually reached to like uh, eight kilometers. And the oldest sediment is around early Cretaceous. Um, the only uh, drilling site we have actually only drilled the early Miocene, um, where the drilling site it's uh, it's drilled on the drift, but it's actually very distal of the drift part, so it doesn't actually tell much information also about the drift development. So all my knowledge about the drift development actually based on this very high intensity uh, seismic data. Uh, but we are not sure, not so sure about the age. I think to talk about the sedimentary features and the, the seismic interpretation without in the geological time, it just doesn't make so much sense. Um, that's why I think uh, it's definitely need a drilling, new drilling in the future for this region. It's the very idea to drill the at least the EOC or legacy boundary. And my clinal forms I found on the slope, I really think this is like a perfect location for the drilling target because um, from my uh, current age model, they are quite old. They're probably from like mid eight, uh, late Eocene to the um, early Oligocene. Uh, but they are actually very shallow because they are very close to the slope and uh, there much sediment on the clinal forms already being eroded, which means you actually drilled like only maybe a few hundred meters, you can already reach the very old sediment and they look very like uh, well preserved clinal forms with continuous reflectors. Uh, I would assume that they probably um, more likely made of the mud instead of a lot of sand. So I have enough reasons to prove that this could be idea uh, drilling target in the future. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any more questions for these four speakers? And uh, of course, if you think of a question later, go ahead and put it in the Q&A and chat and we can address it at the second session, but I'm gonna wait a, a couple more minutes and then we can move on. Seconds probably, not minutes. Okay, let's move to our next uh, four speakers. So Johanna, you're up. We see the presenter mode. Oh, okay, that's great. Okay, okay, thank you. 
Uh, so yeah, I'm Johanna and I will talk about the Pliocene West Antarctic ice sheet dynamics uh, in the Amundsen Sea sector. Um, and I will show you some results from the IODP expedition drill records and seismic analysis. So in general, I'm oh, sorry, it's not working. I cannot change my slide, to be honest. Yes, okay, right now, good. Um, so in general, why are we looking at the West Antarctic ice sheet dynamics? Um, West Antarctic ice sheet highlighted here in the red circle um, is highly sensitive to ocean forcing as it is marine based. <clears throat> and one of the main driving forces you can see on the left image um, where warm deep water masses are flowing below the ice shelf leading to sub ice shelf melting. Um, with the decreased thickness of the ice shelf, also the ability to buttress tributary glaciers from the hinterland is decreasing, and consequently the ice flows accelerating and the grounding line retreating. These processes are highly visible in the Amundsen Sea sector here indicated with the red areas. Um, and uh, in the Amundsen Sea sector, the ice shelf retreats up to 6.8 meters per year. And one of the famous examples is the Pine Island Glacier. So um, therefore the reconstruction of past warm periods like uh, the mid Pliocene warm period can help uh, with the better prediction of the future behavior of the West Antarctic ice sheet. Therefore, um, IODP expedition 379 was realized in 2019 with the research vessel Jardis Resolution in the Amundsen Sea sector which is uh, this key area to analyze uh, those past dynamics. Um, the main goal was to achieve detailed information about past advance and retreat uh, phases. So uh, therefore sites, uh, drill sites U1532 and U1533 were recovered, um, covering Miocene to Pleistocene strata. On this slide, you see an overview um, of the research area where you have in the upper small map, um, the Amundsen Sea sector highlighted within this black box. Then you have on the right, a more detailed view um, of the Amundsen Sea sector with the continental shelf and the continental ice. And on the left, you see a close up view of the drilling locations on the resolution drift. Site U1532 and U1533 were recovered on this drift, which is mainly influenced by um, bottom currents like the Antarctic bottom water or by downslope transfer via deep sea channels and closing this drift. Today, I will show you some results of site U1532. So why did we um, drill on the continental rise? So the continental rise is compared to the continental shelf um, not influenced by erosion processes during ice advances. So here on this slide, you see a um, um, seismic profile from the continental shelf to the continental rise and its location you see on the lower right map. Um, what you can see in those seismic data is that in the Pliocene, um, a progradational shelf growth happened and therefore, um, Site U1532 on the continental rise represents almost undisturbed depositional sequences. Um, so how did we analyze those dynamics? Uh, we used several data sets like physical properties, uh, P-wave velocity, uh, the density, the calculated impedance, as well as color reflectance A and the green-gray color ratio. Then we had a look on uh, uh, some core data like the lithology, uh, um, ice rock to debris amounts, relative diatom abundancy, as well as the sedimentation rate and of course the ages. So at the beginning, we uh, divided the seismic profile into seismic units AS7 to AS10, where we have um, seismic unit AS7 as the lowermost one representing the Miocene. Um, separated by ASU7 with an age assignment of 5.25 million years um, from the Pliocene, which is extending from unit AS8 to AS9. Um, 
separated by the Marco horizon ASU8 uh, with an age of time of 3.6 million years. And um, the uppermost unit AS10 represents the Pleistocene um, separated to the Pliocene um, with an age assignment of 5. Uh, 2.58 million years. So to co correlate those seismic data to the physical properties in the core data, we calculated a synthetic seismogram, which is uh, here highlighted with the orange box. Um, now you see on the left hand uh, this correlation. We have in red the density, in yellow the P wave velocity, and the green uh, in, in green the color reflectance A. And as we had a look on the data, we could identify an interval with highly alternating physical properties, especially um, within subunit AS8C, where we also see uh, high amplitude reflections in the seismic data. Um, this interval can also be, or um, shows also distinct characteristics in the core data, like um, higher biosilicious content, a high amount of ice rafted debris, uh, diatom abundancy, um, and an almost steady sedimentation rate between 4.2 to 3.2 million years. So this interval with all its characteristics, we interpret as in a warm period. And why do we do that? Um, small scale alternations of physical properties like P-wave velocity and gamma ray attenuation density um, are indicating a change in lithology, which then again can be calculated in the impedance and uh, made visible in the synthetic seismogram. Then we had a look on the color reflectance A and the green-gray color ratio. So um, low values of color reflectance A and high values in the green-gray color ratio represent greenish units, which again means that we have a higher biogenic content within the material. And this is supported uh, by the lithology with the higher amount of biosilicious content. Um, indicating a hemipelagic sedimentation under reduced sea ice cover. Then we have the higher amount of ice rafted debris, of course, representing a higher ice rafting, um, so a more intense calving of the glaciers in the Amundsen Sea sector. Then we have um, the high amount of diatom abundancy, um, indicating um, also a reduced sea ice cover and a higher bioproductivity of the ocean. And this all happened between 4.2 to 3.2 million years so prior to the mid Pliocene warm period, which I mentioned at the beginning. All those characteristics can be uh, correlated to changes in the seismic data, like stronger amplitudes and more internal reflections. Just as a short um, reminder, the drilling location was on the continental rise, so it's not influenced by erosion processes, representing almost um, undisturbed depositional sequences from the Miocene to the Pleistocene, um, and um, it's interpreted as in one period. Um, furthermore, we can correlate this to also a quite new study um, where we uh, where Gol et al. discovered some buried grounding zone wedges in the Pliocene in the uh, outer shelf. So buried grounding zone wedges also mean that you have um, longer periods where the ice sheet retreated and hemipelagic sedimentation buried those grounding zone wedges. Yes, thank you very much. And if you have questions, you can ask me then later. Thank you so much. That was great. Um, our next talk is pre recorded. Sorry, I just have to unshare again. <laughs> no worries. Not that I haven't done that before. <laughs> so, yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you again. Well, I suppose I can introduce it while the IT team is getting the, the recording set up. Uh, it's Johan 
um, Clodges and the talk is, oh, there it is. Asymmetry and Antarctic ice sheet cover during the early Oligocene glacial maximum. Good morning and welcome to my talk today, Asymmetry and Antarctic ice sheet cover during the early Oligocene glacial maximum. This is a huge uh, collaborative effort between uh, the Alfred Wegener Institute, the British Antarctic Survey, the University of Southampton, Northumbria University, the Marum in Bremen, uh, UK IUDP and GEOMA in Kiel. And we worked together with a lot of uh, colleagues in the past couple of years to reveal um, the Antarctic ice sheet extent <coughs> and early development at the transition from the Eocene to the Oligocene. So the basic question was when, how and where Antarctica's uh, glaciation was uh, initiated. So this is the image today, uh, how we know the Antarctic continent almost completely glaciated, but um, it is extremely important to know where it all started, uh, where it began, where the ice sheet nucleus potentially was and how different uh, the Antarctic ice sheets, so the main ones, West Antarctic ice sheet and East Antarctic ice sheet, um, developed compared to each other. So therefore, as I said, we have to go back uh, in time to the Eocene Oligocene transition uh, where Antarctica um, <clears throat> started to move away further from uh, other main continents uh, and here in particular Australia and uh, South America through the Drake Passage and the Tasman Gateway and uh, a time where global CO2 contents uh, decreased. Both of these processes um, led basically to the formation of ice sheets on the Antarctic continent. But as I said, so far it remains largely unknown where it all started and how it developed uh, from that point onwards. Uh, basically because we have a large lack of data from the Antarctic continent uh, into that particular time frame. So if we um, take a look at the long-term development of Earth's climate, we see that the Eocene-Oligocene transition was um, characterized by a um, large drop of uh, delta 18 values um, or an increase in uh, ocean water, so uh, a lot of the 16 um, the lighter 16 was incorporated uh, basically into um, ice sheets and was taken away from the ocean. So I marked this here with a red bar. So this is basically the time we are looking at. And <clears throat> we see this prominent data LTNO shift uh, uh, following the Eocene Oligocene boundary. And it displays uh, the onset of early Oligocene uh, glacial maximum about 33.7 million years ago. So, but as I said, it's still largely unknown which land masses were already covered by ice sheets during this early phase of the Kenozoic ice house. And um, during an expedition, during R.B. Polashen expedition um, PS-104, we recovered the West Antarctic shallow marine drill record um, that allows first insights into paleoenvironmental conditions uh, in a sector of the Antarctic continent that is considered to be the key region for understanding West Antarctic ice sheet evolution. So you can see that here. Um, this is the Antarctic topography at, uh, so the minimum topography from Paxman um, et al. Uh, 2019 at 34 million years ago and here you see um, where we recovered um, the MIBO drill core and uh, the seismic stratigraphy from uh, that region can be seen here so um, right before that core we recovered here this core the 20 hyphen 2 where um, Cretaceous and Eocene strata was recovered but then here uh, 50 60 kilometers further um, uh, seawards uh, we recovered a 10 meter long core um, where uh, that comprises uh, the Eocene Oligocene strata. So what we see here in the seismic stratigraphy we definitely see a transition from greenhouse world sediments into ice house world uh, sediments sediments and um, right here at the boundary we recovered this core 10 meter long very fine grained sediments um, and uh, as you can see here this very fine grain uh, sediments uh, tell us uh, absolutely no indication for the presence of nearby grounded or rafting ice so no ice rafted debris in there uh, no coarse uh, material <clears throat> um, here you can see very fine grade silty clay to clay silt 
Um, at the same time, the um, uh, clay minerals tell us uh, that we have a dominance here of illite. Uh, so from uh, physical weathering, uh, basically. Um, but uh, we also see that uh, we have strong evidence for dense notophagous forest uh, vegetation and active surface runoff here in the uh, pollen assemblage. Um, from TEX 86 temperatures, we also um, uh, see surface air and sea surface temperatures match well. So with the pollen temperatures that um, we um, uh, took from the notophagus uh, uh, or from the pollen assemblage and they both match very well and indicate summer temperatures of around 9 degrees Celsius, mean winter temperatures of, of, of around 3 degrees Celsius and a relatively high precipitation rate of uh, more than 600 millimeters per year. So we see a cool temperate environment. Um, and the biomarkers for minifer assemblages and the grain shapes um, that you can see here, um, also in these uh, columns um, here uh, and here, um, suggest active surface runoff, um, probably by rivers and creeks, um, into a marine environment. Important uh, that we see this in marine environment at this uh, particular site because then only the minimum topography of uh, Paxman here can be the valid one. So the medium and maximum topography um, in, in those topographies, our core site uh, would be on land. So we see no indication for West Antarctic ice sheet presence during the early Oligocene glacial maximum. If at all, then uh, there uh, would be only small hinterland ice caps present. Um, the drill site is definitely, um, has definitely deposited in a marine environment, so therefore only the minimum topography uh, of Paxman and Al can be validated, and um, the presence of a transarctic seaway is very likely. Um, so <clears throat> what we delivered now um, is uh, a very important multi-proxy data set from an area where no data was available so far. So, and uh, as you can see by um, modeling attempts in past years, um, the ice sheet extent uh, for this particular time frame is very different uh, in simulations. So from full glaciation at the Eocene Oligocene transition or the earliest Oligocene uh, glacial maximum to very small um, ice caps or small ice sheets in the hinterland. So which one of those uh, simulations is, uh, can be validated is the, is the correct one. And now by filling this uh, very serious uh, data gap, um, we um, ensure a circumantarctic uh, data set that can be used to validate uh, which of uh, those um, simulations um, is the correct one. So previous modeling attempts are extremely uncertain uh, since they are largely or remain largely unconstrained uh, by re reliable data. And it was also not um, um, known which topography for 34 million years is uh, the valid one. So what we see here is the uh, collection of different uh, data for the early, uh, earliest Oligocene time frame from around Antarctica um, for sea surface temperatures but also um, continental temperatures uh, and we now deliver this uh, new um, multi-proxy data set here and also we collected uh, information about ice extent during this early phase of the Chemozoic Ice House. So how can that be improved that we now know which uh, model uh, is the most reliable one? Therefore we developed uh, a new model, a fully coupled um, or a system model that uh, incorporates uh, an atmosphere, an ocean and a landmass component and this together, so the climate um, simulations from those were then incorporated into the parallel ice sheet model to explore the ice sheet extent during this early phase. So what we can see, we did that for three different um, uh, CO2 um, atmospheric contents, uh, 280, so pre-industrial, 560, two times pre-industrial, and 840, three times. This is significant because three times would be the one that is also very close to reconstructed CO2 values at the time. Um, so so the sea surface and surface air temperatures for the three different uh, CO2 scenarios are quite different, uh, different as uh, expected. Um, so the three times uh, PI uh, values correspond to reconstructed values very well at 33.8 million years. Um, and definitely gives the best match with earliest Oligocene circumantarctic sea surface temperatures and surface air temperature reconstructions that we um, also uh, delivered here. So the warmest surface ocean and uh, air offshore um, is 
uh, in the warmer surface ocean and air is offshore the northern Victoria land that you can see here. So this is uh, the area where this warm water and also warm uh, temperatures uh, reach uh, the continent and the coast and probably because of the raising transatlantic mountains here at, this, at, the, at the same time um, we ensure that um, we have uh, initial precipitation here. We have through the rising uh, transatlantic mountains um, the effect that uh, these warm air masses can uh, participate and form um, a permanent uh, snow and ice cover and uh, this then is probably also the nucleus for the East Antarctic ice sheet at this time. So the modeled ice sheet extent um, that we show here for 80, uh, 840 ppm um, <clears throat> matches with data constraints for ice presence in the Western Ross Sea Embayment and Prince Bay and the early Oligocene ice volume estimates um, um, are between 1.55 and 3. 3.3 um, um, million um, uh, cubic kilometers and this uh, matches very well with uh, our results from fully coupled modeling um, for the early Oligocene glacial maximum uh, where we result in 1.25 um, million cubic uh, kilometers for this particular time frame so that matches very well. So the conclusions are we deliver the first direct evidence of Western Arctic continental paleo environment during the onset of the Kenozoic ice house, um, so also called the early Oligocene glacial maximum and between 33.7 and 33.2 million years. We conclude a cool temperate climate um, without any indication for the presence of marine terminating ice. Uh, we deliver multi-proxy results um, combined with other um, um, Eocene, Oligocene boundary, circumantarctic paleo environmental data, and those together serve as validation for the RV Earth system model new newly developed, um, whose resulting climate was then used as an input for the parallel ice sheet model. What we then see is that West Antarctica uh, remained free of uh, grounded ice throughout the Eocene, Oligocene, uh, the, the early Oligocene glacial maximum. Um, with coastal regions in West Antarctica starting to glaciate at least 7 million years later than on East Antarctica, where the ice sheet uh, likely nucleated in coastal Victoria land, as you can see here in the lower left. So what we deliver is now a reliable description of early Antarctic ice sheet uh, development, highlighting the import importance of differential regional response for past but also future Antarctic cryospheric, cryospheric change. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Um, our next two talks are pre-recorded, but uh, both Sandra and uh, Anne are here to answer questions. So go ahead. So if the um, IT support could, could share the next presentation. And let's move to our final talk from Anne. Uh, do you have do you have the video uploaded? Do you, I can do it live uh, as well. I believe the IT team has it, so it's whatever you would like to do. Um, let's just do it live. I'm here. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, just bear with me. I'm not as proficient as most of you on this. And let me get that all looks good. <laughs> um, but you probably saw, see all this, leave that down. All right, um, so I just wanna tell you a little bit about the Polar Rock Repository. Um, I'm grateful to Ellie, Gavin, Jessica, and Jamie for all mentioning it um, today and yesterday. So the repository makes samples available to researchers around the world, and you can use destructive techniques on the samples uh, when you get them for your research. Um, we have about 60,000 samples at the moment, um, mostly bedrock samples, but quite a few unconsolidated uh, samples, tills and sands, a lot of dredge samples that we've broken down into the individual class rather than just getting a bag of 
dredge samples. Uh, we've actually broken them out so you can actually see what the lithologies are. And then we have a couple bedrock cores. We've also started a, an image archive um, so that scientists can sort of see what the field area might look like from both a logistics and science viewpoint. And Jamie was mentioning, mentioning this a little bit yesterday about um, seeing some of the outcrops and seeing where there are erratics. Uh, let me go to the next one. So when we get samples uh, at the repository, we generally, you know, we might have a description if we're lucky um, and we know where they were collected and when and who. But um, we try to note any unusual features that might be occurring on the rocks, um, things like uh, olivine inclusions, uh, weathering, I call them weathering salts, Jessica has calcite skins, you know, just any of this little evaporitic sort of crusts that are on the rocks, we, we tend to record that. Um, lichen, uh, moss, the dredge samples have quite a bit of coral, marine invertebrates, marine plants on them. Um, and then iron staining. And then in the, in the, when you do a search, you can also see if we have field notes or hand-drawn maps or any supporting information about the samples. So for paleoclimate research, so I, I know you've seen some of these sort of pictures already um, from, from Jessica and Gavin. Um, so we have these strange precipitates from the elephant moraine and, and a few other spots along the Transantarctics. Um, we have over 3,200 identified Cenozoic sedimentary samples in the collection. Um, we probably, I think we have around 800 of the Sirius group um, that Ellie was just talking about. Uh, there's quite a few other places where people were reluctant to call it Sirius group, but looks pretty much like Sirius group um, in the collection as well. And the, uh, the, the uh, encrustations on the rocks from, from uh, being wet. And then we do have a you know tiny collection of, of samples that uh, our soils or rocks where we'll identify that has sort of soil residue on the bottom. And just uh, this is just a list of some recent publications uh, from uh, using the samples at the repository from, uh, sort of from the Cenozoic sedimentary samples. So I'll, another big area uh, of samples that might be of relevance to the paleoclimate community uh, are the volcanics. And we have over 5,000 Cenozoic volcanics everywhere from the tip of the peninsula all through West Antarctica and, and down through uh, the Transantarctics. And this is of interest uh, for primarily because people are concerned whether there's active volcanism beneath the West Antarctic ice sheet or relatively recent volcanism uh, and what effect geothermal heat flux has with the marine birdland plume. So we have a couple unique collections um, I'd like to point out. Um, so in West Antarctica, um, Barclay Cam and the Caltech group collected sub-ice basal pebbles in the 1970s and 80s that we have over here. And I think we have about 800 of these pebbles. Um, so they may be of, be of interest to people um, for, for provenance or comparison with other thing, cores that are being done now. Um, the other large collection that we have, and, and both of these, I should say, are vastly underutilized um, we have all these dredge samples and we've broken these out as individual clasts. And this is over 1300 samples down here of just igneous uh, clasts that we've identified from the samples and quite a few of these are mafic. So they may be of interest to, to somebody someday um, about trying to document how much volcanic activity is at least being brought down to the ice shelf and deposited as these dredge samples. And then we've had a few recent publications uh, using the, the uh, vol volcanic rocks. Okay, so now I'm gonna attempt to um, stop my screen share and show you how to use the website. And hopefully this will work. Ah, yeah, look at that. Okay, so, um, so I know a number of you are very familiar with using the website, um, but there is a tutorial over here uh, to show you how to, look for samples and then also how to request them uh, that we can send them to you. Um, I'm gonna show you the photo archive first just for a minute or two, because I think that this is, is a, a really a great resource that I'm hoping to, to expand quite a bit. When you zoom in uh, to an area that you might be interested in, um, you can see what photos we have and you can, you can see the table, you know, who took them and when they were taken. But most importantly, I think uh, here is that 
that you'll want to see this, these images up close. So we can expand the table. And as Jamie was saying yesterday, it's nice to be able to look at the top of these outcrops and see whether there might be erratics or see what the glacial surface conditions might be like. And we have quite a few of these images are from Polnet. I wanna give a shout out to Terry Wilson and her group uh, for providing these images. And she also provided uh, some movies. Which are great if you're, you know, trying to plan a field season down here and you don't really know what the, what the logistics situation is going to be for getting into the outcrop. So they provided movies and, and images. Let me just stop that and go back. I'll stop that and go back here to the, the photo archive. So we've got images that they span more than 60 years from all around the continent. Now let's go back uh, here to the uh, sample collection. So you can just double click on that, uh, the icon. And so we have almost 60,000 samples. You can just zoom into an area. A yellow is dredge, obviously, and then the red. I'm gonna go right into South Victoria land. So with our mapping feature, uh, we're using the Polar Geospatial Center uh, Ge um, Antarctic Viewer, which is about, uh, a half a meter resolution until about 82 south. And then of course it gets, gets worse, but you can add the, um, the USGS map on top to look where the samples are. You can also put the REMA uh, viewer on top as well. Take that off. And we just zoom in, oops, zoom in a little bit more here into the, into the dry valleys. And as you can see, we still have almost 500 samples here just within the valleys. Um, so let's try to narrow this down a little bit. You can come in here to the different ad criteria. So we're gonna choose chronology first, it could be any, any sequence and type Cenozoic, add that. Um, let's say that we're looking for ash samples from the, the valleys, add the ash sample. And let's say you wanna do some dating with it. So you're gonna need a couple hundred grams. Let's say you need at least 300, add that in. And then here's the samples that would be available to you uh, for that uh, dating work. And you can expand the table, see who collected them. You can get information about each sample. If I click on this, you can get more detailed information uh, about the sample, uh, whatever was in the notes that were provided to me. And you can request the sample, put it in your shopping cart. You can also uh, download these results as a CSV file, and we can also look at these as a thumb sheet. And let's say you like a couple other ones here, you can add those um, to your shopping cart. Yeah, where are we at here? So um, let me go back one here. Oops, my frozen. I apologize, it seems like it's a little bit frozen there. Um, so this is just kind of how to do a quick search using the database and uh, you can request samples using that shopping cart and check out and then all this, I will get the list of samples that you are requesting and send them to you. And I just, one other thing, I guess I'd show you, you could share a link if you wanted to, keep the link of that search that you've generated. And you can also uh, print this out, which will show the map and uh, the table uh, uh, that's down here. And then of course you can save it as a CSV file. And I'm, I'm sorry that it seems like it's, a, it's not showing you the, um, uh, the checkout cart because it appears that it's somehow I'm in the back end of the database, let me just exit this for one moment and just, just go here. Let's try this again. There's our shopping cart. And oops, there's the sample that we want. Do we want to, you could remove it or we can uh, keep it. And you can then uh, request the samples. So that's pretty much all I have. Um, any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Anne. Um, so now we're headed into some Q&A. And while you are thinking of questions for any of our speakers, I'm going to take advantage of having the mic and ask Anne a question, uh, which is that are these um, photo archives and the videos that you have, they look amazing. Are they available for use for education and presentations as well, or just reconnaissance? Uh, no, I, I, you could just use those for education. Um, when people have donated them, they, they basically allow them to be used for whatever research and education pur purposes are required. Great, thank you. And Terry's got some great ones. The farther back in time, they're the old 35 millimeter slides, so they're not quite as sharp. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. Um, I have a couple questions, but I'd actually like to start with Anne first. Um, thank you for bringing this to the session because I know, um, you know, as you said, a lot of people, especially yesterday, thanked you and uh, the repository for the material that made the talks in this session possible. I have a question, you know, kind of following the theme of this session, which is marine and terrestrial records integrated. You know, and I'm curious, as somebody who primarily uses the marine repository, um, where we do put dredge material, and where we do put you know, um, grabs with lots of big rocks in them. Um, when are we supposed to send stuff to you versus the marine repository? And what is the line when we have big rocks, you know, hard rocks of some type in our marine sediment? How are those divvied up? And how should a user know where to go look for those types of things? Yeah, that's a great question. So. My understanding, although it's been a little muddied, is that the, the, dredge rock, the dredge samples come to the repository and any marine cores and grabs go to Oregon State. Um, and so far, uh, those dredge samples have been coming mostly from the Palmer. I don't know what to say about those, those other ones where you say you've got some sediment and some big rocks in them. I would think they should stay all together. But purely dredge samples, I think, could uh, would would come to the repository. And then we all use this uh, site called IMLGS, uh, the core repositories, and I do as well, where we make available any of the marine uh, samples. So they they're searchable on the IMLGS site. The curator there uh, retired a number of years ago, so it has not been updated, and they're actively working on that now. So it's. It's not very current, but it, it should be in a year or two. I, I've never heard of that. That's awesome. If there's some sort of joint link, joint searchable database, that's awesome. Yeah, and I, I can send you the, the link to that. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it works. Um, it may not be as smooth as trying to look through our database, but, I, but you'll at least see where there's samples. Yeah, so I'll send it to you in a few minutes. I'll ask a question to you, Anne, as well, actually, while, uh, while we've got you here. Uh, so for some, for yeah, a lot of samples, it depends on the method that they're going to be used for, and some methods might require certain details. So kind of building on what Jamie presented yesterday and using cosmogenic nuclide kind of exposure dating as a potential application, like he highlighted, um, there is it's important for, for that to have a, a pretty high precision um, elevation measurement of the sample. And obviously, if you look collecting some rocks that have been, you know, what, what they were collected, say, a couple of decades ago, they're probably not going to have high enough precision, even if they do have some sort of elevation measurement. Um, but going forward, it, um, I'm not sure if there's any, if it, is there a template? I guess the first question is, is there a template for um, people to provide information? Um, and if there, if, there, if there is a template or if that's being developed, um, it would be useful to try and have some sort of 
uncertainty category on some of the measurements that are being provided uh, as part of that sample. So we do have an Excel template. Um, so, if, you know, for the exposure age dating crowd, you know, you guys require a lot more detail than, as you say, normally will come in with samples. I mean, I do have Greg Balco samples, but apart from that, most samples won't have that level of detail. We might have, it might be pretty close to give you a ballpark, but, um, but we do have a template, you know, in my dream world, we could try to get SCAR to, to have a database where all this could be together because the earth science databases generally are not, they're not very easy to use. And I, I think if we could all put our data into this kind of database, wouldn't it be awesome? We could all see what's out there at, all at one go. I'm not quite sure how to make that happen, but that's my dream. Yeah, well, it's, it's a great resource. And um, yeah, I don't know if, you, I mean, you probably have quite a good idea of the different um, groups that, and different applications that make use of the repository. Um, so I don't know if there's uh, possible to get some feedback from those users as to what information they would ideally need. Um, and then that could be put into the template. But it sounds like for most people's uses, it's, it's great as it is. Yeah, we're always willing to make uh, try to make changes and uh, add new fields uh, that would be relevant that you know we hadn't thought about 20 years ago when we were getting started. So yeah, I certainly want to be able to have that flexibility to to add things into the database. I have a question for Sandra. If she's here, I, she turned her camera off. Awesome. Um, thank you for that talk. That was great. I enjoyed um, listening to that uh, presentation. I had a question about sort of the timing of the onset of glaciation. And earlier in the talk, you mentioned that the chemical index of alteration suggested that material was coming from glaciated terrains. And at least when I heard that, again, that was earlier in the talk, it sounded like that was throughout most of your core, but then for the onset of glaciation, you had a date at 34.5, I think. And so can you just say if those two lined up and is the CIA showing glacial terrain before you otherwise have onset? Yeah, so that's that's a really good question. And actually, if I had had more time, I would have explained it in the presentation. So okay. um, yes, uh, the material is delivered from glaciated terrains throughout, but it's from different sources. So initially, it's only from probably some peninsula ice sheets or smaller alpine glaciers that were there. You're very familiar, I think, with the work because I think you're a co-author on some of that. So um, from the, the Shelgo course, you know, mm -hmm. there's a, a evidence of the, I think it's SEM textures that there's mm -hmm. alpine glaciation, yeah. even in the yeah. Eocene. Exactly. So yeah, um, initially there is glacial supply from the peninsula, but nothing that indicates West Antarctic sources. Yeah. Um, so that is coming in later. So again, still supply from glaciated terrains, but different ones that are now farther south. So that's mm -hmm. the explanation that we came up with for, for that relatively constant signature through the core. That's pretty interesting, I think, too, because, you know, for the Shadow cores, that's proposed with pretty limited data that there was that earlier sort of alpine glaciation. So to see you finding um, a new data that substantiates that, that's very nice to see. Thank you. And, you know, and lots of complex threads coming in to build that story for you. It's not easy. We need more work. <laughs> And it's coming. Victoria is working on some more, even. Excellent. Thank you. I was also just going to ask a question to you, Sandra, that kind of follow up. You mentioned in your talk 
about the development of a marine-based ice sheet in the Weddell Sea. I wasn't, is that something that would uh, kind of established in say the Ellsworth Mountains and then um, was kind of flowing into Weddell Sea area? Or are you saying that it kind of originated on some relatively higher topography in the Weddell Sea itself? Yeah, so with the limited data that we have still, I think what it shows is that there is ice developing probably on the higher elevations in the Elkhart Mountains that then at some point reaches the coast there and is supplying sediment to the marine environment. Um, I don't know how otherwise we would get that sediment to the site than with currents um, that are similar to a proto well sea gyre that is pushing that glacial signature sediment, you know, remember the low CIA is saying it's not chemically weathered uh, to the site. So I don't know exactly how big the ice sheet would have to be to establish that, but there's definitely some glaciation, I think, in the sea that's supplying sediment. And, you know, <laughs> I don't think Johan is here. No. <laughs> Uh, we should talk probably <laughs> because there's so many people working in isolation on the same problem but because the conferences are all online we are sleeping at different times and we're not talking really but we will hopefully in the near future glad if this online conference can help bring some of that together oh yeah thanks for this i really enjoy it. i'm really enjoying it Excellent. That reminds me of one question I had, which is that, um, as you mentioned, Sandra, you and Johan and, and Shaoxia also are looking at the same problem in three different ways. And so I'm wondering if either of you who are here had any sort of reaction to um, one of the other presentations and the different proxies and databases and methods and reconstruction, um, you know, do some comparing and contrasting there. Did anyone, did either of you have um, any comments about that? Well, actually, when I was listening to Sharsha's talk, I, I thought she was saying something similar to what we proposed, that there is the onset of these drifts developed um, in the early Oligocene. When we say there is the Antarctic slope current starting to gear up to bring these cold water mass to the wells, it seems like she is saying something similar, but a different data set, which I thought was really cool. Did I misrepresent what you were saying, Xia Xia, or uh, I hope not? <laughs> I think because we are working in the different regions at the moment, uh, in the Pritz Bay, it's uh, um, quite different from the Weddell Sea. I actually worked in the Weddell Sea for my PhD. <laughs> So uh, I think those um, drift uh, also, like I mentioned in the Pritz Bay, which uh, started much earlier, but in the Weddell Sea, uh, from my knowledge, I think the drift were mostly mm, formed around the early to middle male scene. Uh, well, I have to see because of the drilling site are so sparse and the, the seismic data really don't uh, give uh, or very helpful to judge the age of the, um, the drift bodies. So I think in the future, it's probably necessary to just trading the certain locations, the bottom of the drift uh, to really solve this problem like when exactly the the drift happened i think if you know this answer probably we really understand the, the yeah this complex process which controls the drift formation <laughs> so just to clarify do you think the drift formation in Pritz bay that you were discussing that was in the early oligocene right that that really yes. started but yeah. I have to point out that in the Pritz Bay deep water, there's, there's actually no uh, drilling which reached the early Olego thing. The uh, oldest sediment is early Miocene, but you can see that it's much shallower 
than the bottom of the drift. So which means the, the onset of drift is much older than the early Miocene. Uh, yeah, so I hope it makes sense. I think it's actually very obvious because the, um, there's only one drilling site, Vama 65, which was dr drilled in the distal part of the drift. Which I is... was on board the ship for that. I was oh, on board really? the ship for that one. <laughs> why, why, why you don't suggest to go like a little bit to the main body of the drift? <laughs> I, I was a PhD student at that time, so I, I didn't know how to ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, well, I think it was um, the reason was we were supposed to drill into the Oligocene, I think even to the EO boundary, if I remember it correctly. But mm -hmm. the, the velocities were so different from what was expected. So we ended up with a lot of Miocene and we didn't reach our target. So it was the objective, but, you know, we just didn't have any other drill holes to go by to estimate mm -hmm. the ages of the reflectors. Mm -hmm. But I, I definitely agree with you. We should go back to Pritz Bay because yeah. there's still <laughs> a lot to learn. Yeah. I follow up all your publications from that region. Um, I think it, it's really necessary. Mm, I have like a ambitious goal, but I cannot make it by myself, definitely, to really like a quotation for the new drilling in this region. Uh, I think, you know, compared to the other regions, this region, it's actually relatively easy to um, operate uh, because with like sea ice, especially on the slope and the deep water. Um, and also, um, I mean, today I was really nervous about the time <laughs> limit. I really, uh, I wrote like her manuscript about the clinal forms. So I um, really uh, want to like her quotation, uh, this clinal forms that might be worse to be drilled in the future. <laughs> yeah. Great idea. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone here will argue against drilling more sites. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't understand why the first ODP like in the Pritzby region was actually only uh, from the Pritzby shelf and the Kogla plateau, and there's nothing in the deep water. And the other mysterious thing is uh, the Pritzby was uh, the deep water part was like uh, stopped. Uh, any research activities since 2004. So it's almost 20 years, like really quiet. Um, yeah, maybe Faye Albright <laughs> need to come back. Yeah. yeah, so we need new people to get in, to get it to work, you know? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the new one. <laughs> Maybe I'll ask a question to Joanna about a, the newest um, of the <laughs> drill legs there. Um, 379. Um, thank you for your talk today um, in this session. Um, I wanted to ask in your conclusions, um, obviously I've seen some of this before um, and um, fully agree with some of the um, outcomes, you know, regarding um, indication for dynamic West Antarctic HD, absolutely. And I understand the interpretation of an extended period of retreat, but I'm wondering if the data could also be consistent with instead of extended period of retreat, could it be periods of rapid oscillation that are maybe dominantly retreated dominantly on the less glacial side, but in actuality, what we're seeing um, at the 379 area and then in your seismic is not truly just extended retreat, but rather rapid oscillation. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's not just a like really long retreat period. It's always mm -hmm. coming back, but we cannot really like resolve 
uh, how often it's coming back and it's going like how often it re-advances. So, I mean, um, I don't know if you remember the last slide with the buried grounding zone wedges. Um, um, you saw probably like uh, several generations and that basically means it was like for a longer period, it was retreated, then you had the semi-pelagic sedimentation, then it came back, um, yeah. Um, yeah, pushed another grounding zone wedge, retreated again with sedimentation so on. So it was oscillating, yeah. So it was like more dynamic. It, I mean, in general, you have like uh, a warmer period, but uh, also like within the uh, diatom abundancy and so on, you also see sometimes some periods where the abundancy was like quite low compared to uh, other time frames. But in general, we really cannot like resolve it in the seismic data. So we just made it quite, yeah, just uh, how do you say it? <laughs> Continuous. <laughs> yeah. And it was like uh, over, yeah, I don't know how to say it right now. Um, yeah, like that, that somebody, uh, somebody should uh, have a look on the oscillation in that time. Um, like, I think that's maybe more for sedimentologists or uh, um, paleontologists, <laughs> not really for the seismic and geophysic methods. <laughs> Um, but I mean, I would be happy if somebody would do that because it would help also with the interpretation. Yeah. Thank but you. yeah, it's more an oscillation forth and back. Well, thanks everybody for coming today and uh, especially thanks to the speakers. And you've got some um, kudos in the Q&A from Jamie. I just wanted to make sure you saw that. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, and um, don't forget to look at the e-posters that are part of this session as well. There's a link in the chat and uh, the recording should be on, the recording of this session and yesterday's session should also be available on the website soon. So uh, thanks everybody and hope to see you in person or virtual again soon. Bye. Bye.